webinar series. Um, it will be recorded and uh, streamed live on CMI's YouTube channel, just for all of you to know before we start. Um, I'm delighted to be here. My name is Yibeke Jansson. I'm head of uh, CMI's office in, in Brussels. Um, and I'm very happy to be moderating this uh, last year's webinar uh, of this year, when we will reflect on whether and how the war in Ukraine and related developments are reshaping peacemaking, something we have been talking about for some time now, uh, but that we're trying to um, conceptualize a little bit and share with you some of our main points. We will depart from some of the thoughts that we've summarized in a CMI Insight. It's a short uh, policy brief type of paper that's available on our website. And I believe there'll be a link in the chat uh, where you can find that paper. Uh, but before I go into introducing the speakers, let me just contextualize a little bit uh, where we're coming from. Um, the full scale invasion of, uh, Russia's, uh, of Russia's invasion of Ukraine took many of us by surprise. And this despite the very clear news coverage of a Russian mobilization along the Ukrainian border that led up to the 24th of February. The fact that we were so surprised when we should have perhaps not been is an indication of what has to be seen as a less effective international and global order. The safeguards that we're relying on and that we clearly believed in for a peaceful coexistence of states now in the light of this seem uh, less effective and perhaps need to be reconsidered. This in turn suggests that we have to revisit our means of making peace since what was essentially set up as a preventive safeguard after the Second World War with the UN Charter at the center is also what we've been relying on to a large extent to help solve conflicts once they arise. The war in Ukraine, however, makes this very difficult as one of the parties is a member, permanent member of the UN Security Council. In other words, Russia's invasion of Ukraine is likely to reshape international relations. And this is something that we're arguing in our paper or in CMI's paper. If we look at how uh, conflict trends have been mapped since 1946 until 2021, uh, notably I'm referring now to the Peace Research Institute Oslo figures, for example, but they're repeated in many other research studies, uh, interstate conflicts have largely replaced conflicts between states from 1946 to 2021. However, there's also a trend since 2014 already that the number of internationalized civil conflicts has substantially increased. And this confirms our second takeaway that we're going into reality where global security risks will only increase, uh, increasingly come to stem from tensions between states, but without necessarily meaning that the one will replace the other, but that the tensions between states will more influence the way wars are being waged between or within states. Um, at the international level, the reaction to the Russian invasion of Ukraine has polarized the world even further, reinforcing geopolitical tensions that were already on the rise. Our multilateral institutions and structures that were also uh, under threat before the, the invasion, responsible for international peace and security, have been left in a state of uncertainty. While the EU has been consolidated, this has had the opposite effect on its external relations, in particular with the global south. In the UN Security Council, they've been able to agree on a grain deal. This amounts to a humanitarian agreement and not to preserve international peace and security, even if it will help to calm down some of the tensions related to food security that the war in Ukraine has sparked. Um, there is not even a clear pen holder for Ukraine in the UN Security Council. There's a depoliticization of one of the most political challenges that we're standing in front of because uh, one of its fundamental principles are now being uh, challenged by one of the permanent fights waging war on another sovereign state. But to dwell into this a little bit more, let me introduce the speakers who will uh, deconstruct this a little bit. Uh, we have with us uh, Dr. Wille Brummer, who has been the Chief Program Officer at CMI since 2013. I'm sure uh, many of you have already seen and heard him. He has the overall responsibility for leading the design and implementation of CMI's programmatic work. Uh, and he's been with CMI since 2008, led and advised on various international teams and has in-depth knowledge and practical experience on different tasks related to mediation processes. We also have with us Dr. David Lanz, who is the representative for dialogue promotion at the International Crisis Group. Equally here, I'm sure that many of you know of David. He has over 15 years of experience supporting international mediation processes and leading dialogue efforts. 
He's led Swiss Peace Mediation Program for six years and served in the OSCE's Conflict Prevention Center for three years, deploying as part of the organization's response to the Ukraine crisis in 2014. He's also uh, been part of a UN mission in, in Sudan. Uh, but without uh, further ado, let me then ask you, let me start with uh, Bill, and let me ask you, um, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has been compared to the attack on the Twin Towers in New York in terms of there being a world before and after those two dates, respectively. Would you agree with this analysis and what does it mean for international uh, peace and security? Bill, over to you. Thanks. Thank you, Yvette, so much. And, uh, Dave. You have to unmute yourself, I think, Mila. Yeah, I think that uh, it's, uh, it should be muted. Is this? Uh, yes. So thank you so much, Yvette, and uh, and uh, thanks, David, for for joining the um, uh, joining the discussion. I would say that uh, uh, yes, uh, the um, uh, uh, Russian attack to Ukraine is. Uh, one of the pivotal moments, uh, moments of, of uh, international security. Maybe not in a way that uh, it changes everything, but uh, I think that it's it's more like an event which uh, shows something uh, uh, which have been underlying there for uh, for a long time. And um, if you look at first on the on the 9/11 uh, one uh, on the uh, now looking at that, uh, one can see that as uh, as uh, Consolidation of the world order, where uh, Cold War uh, ended, and the um, uh, wars between the states uh, 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 were replaced by the um, uh, threat coming from the uh, non-state actors. And I would say that uh, after that, it has been more or less the glue in the international community, uh, fight against the terrorism, and and keeping the uh, countries together. In in, in different forms, uh, what comes to the international peace and security, despite uh, the grievances on the on, on the background, and uh, having a common enemy as as a non-state actor, I think that it has kept uh, uh, many of the coalitions alive, starting from uh, uh, 2001 uh, uh, Afghanistan uh, until the uh, a very recent uh, uh, fight against the Daesh. Where at the end of the day, uh, uh, there was a very unholy alliance uh, fighting against the uh, uh, fighting against the um, uh, uh, terrorist group. I would say that um, uh, there have been a, a long-term trend as well that the um, uh, tension between the states have been increasing, and uh, rather than full war between the states, uh, uh, those have been uh, uh, taking the form of different type of uh, proxy books. And now uh, what comes to the uh, Ukraine, I think that it's very clear that uh, uh, a conflict between the states are here again and the open wars between the states are, are, are here again. And it's a long-term process where I think that uh, uh, where we have ended them now. And funny enough, I would say that uh, still a couple of years ago, this conflict were tried to solve as an internal conflict of Ukraine, which now sounds a bit funny, but a year ago it was still a, a very, very standard way of working at the international community. What are the challenges then on of this trend? Uh, there's a couple of those, at least. Um, uh, Looking at the fight against terrorism, I think that it has been an asymmetric warfare, and the whole hybrid warfare uh, have been developing in the space of uh, asymmetric warfare and the uh, fight against the terrorism. Now, all the elements of uh, uh, state non state actor wars have lifted to the level of uh, war between the, the states, and all the needs developed uh, starting from um, Cyber warfare, information warfare, energy, uh, um, economic isolation, and so on and so on. Now those are fully applied uh, at the level of states, which increases the scale of hybrid warfare to the uh, to the new level. In the same way, it has been rather easy way to handle the conflict that uh, when 
something is a bit too difficult to uh, nominate someone as a terrorist. The evil, the someone that you don't talk to anymore, someone who should be isolated from the system and to whom it's legitimate uh, to um, use very uh, tough means. Somehow this same idea of right and wrong have been now shifted to the level of states as well, where uh, uh, rightly or wrongly, um, there's a more and more debate uh, in the international communities, who is right, who is wrong. And that is really a fundamental uh, a challenge for the peacemaking, especially um, uh, the definition of who is right and wrong is not uh, who is good and who is evil. It's not done at the multilateral level, but it's done uh, in, uh, in a different coalitions. So I think that all these, all these trends described in the paper, they are long-term trends. But at the end of the day, somehow the um, uh, Russian attack to Ukraine is a pivotal moment where these all trends get uh, 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 jumped to a different scale. Thanks. Thank you uh, very much, Lila, for those insights. Uh, and I think it's very interesting to think about exactly what we said, how 12 months ago we still perceived the, the tensions within Ukraine as uh, intrastate, uh, when so clearly something else was going on. Um, um, and a certain denial of uh, that the structures are not, no longer able to, to uh, allow us to agree on who is right and wrong and who is good and evil. But let me move on then to, to David. How do you see all of this? Um, uh, and what do you think the more general trends that we've described so far mean for peacemaking? So the actual the tools, the actors and the processes, what do you see as the, the main trends? Where do we go from here in improving the situation? David. Thank you, Yebeke. Um, CMI colleagues for inviting me. Um, this is a really timely, important discussion, and I think Ville kicked us off uh, quite well. So I think, you know, on the sort of broad theme of the event, um, at the outset, it's important to say that overall, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the fallout from it has had a negative impact on peacemaking. We, we live in a world that is more complicated, uh, more fraught, more dangerous um, when it comes to um, the, the push to prevent conflicts and, and resolve them. Um, why, why is this so? It, it may seem quite obvious, but nonetheless good to uh, remind ourselves. The Russian invasion of Ukraine showed the, the failure of eight years of peacemaking to resolve the conflict in eastern Ukraine. It also showed the blatant disregard of core norms that underpin um, peacemaking at the international level by a permanent member of the UN Security Council. And uh, it created global tensions that uh, have complicated negotiation processes uh, worldwide. So in a nutshell, the war in Ukraine has been bad news for peacemaking. At the same time, I think we can say um, from today's vantage point, um, 10 months into the war, um, the consequences could have been even, even worse. Uh, and um, I'm sure we'll come back to that um, notion a bit later on. But talking about the impact of the war in Ukraine, I think it makes sense to first zoom in a little bit and look at a number of settlement processes in terms of how they have been uh, impacted. And of course, uh, we can um, start with Ukraine, where the 24 February invasion has upended settlement negotiations between Ukraine and Russia, the Minsk process, trilateral contact group, Normandy format, uh, and so on. Um, that's quite clear. Then beyond Ukraine, we see that uh, negotiation processes that uh, have re relied on cooperation between uh, Russia and Western countries have suffered. So in Moldova, the five plus two process is in a deep freeze. The Geneva international discussions dealing with conflicts in Georgia uh, were initially postponed. Uh, the political process in Libya has also faced some issues and the Iran nuclear negotiations, they were interrupted um, due to the fallout over the war in Ukraine at a crucial point in, in March. 
Um, the fear uh, a couple of months back was that these processes would uh, collapse. And uh, today uh, we can say this didn't, this didn't happen. So in, in a way, um, the impact while negative has not been quite as, as grim. Um, and we can revisit the cases I mentioned earlier. So in Moldova, uh, negotiations between the Moldovan government in Chisinau and the de facto authorities in Transnistria um, have continued. And the situation in Moldova remains relatively stable. Uh, in Georgia, the Geneva International discussions, they were uh, revived. Uh, in Libya and Iran, negotiations have not been uh, successful, but this is um, mainly due to uh, factors other than the rift between uh, Russia and the West. Uh, now, there are also some contexts where uh, initially the war in Ukraine has created new dynamics, which provided momentum for negotiations. Um, uh, some momentum, but not nearly enough to get us over the uh, finish line when it comes to a settlement. A uh, case in point is Nagorno-Karabakh, where we have seen multiple high level meetings between Armenia and Azerbaijan, but there are also spikes in violence and so far a settlement remains uh, elusive. Uh, we can mention Venezuela as well, where there has been some movement in the direction of renewed negotiations, but uh, progress there has also been limited. And uh, I think in any case, it's the regional political environment that changes uh, in the region that uh, is the main driving force rather than the, uh, the repercussions of the war in Ukraine. Um, so then there are also, I think it's good to uh, remember not, not to uh, be too, too focused on Ukraine. There are a number of peacemaking efforts where the war in Ukraine has not been a major factor. We can mention uh, Ethiopia here and the recent um, agreement to end the war in Tigray. Also Yemen, the truce in early April and um, since October, the uh, so far futile attempts to extend the, the truce. Um, so that's sort of the, the impact on specific settlement processes. Now, if we zoom out um, a, a little bit, and, and I'm uh, picking up where, where Avila left off, the fallout over the Russian invasion of Ukraine has reinforced a number of global trends that, for the most part, make peacemaking more difficult and more complicated. And uh, just to briefly mention uh, three trends here. Um, First, the war in Ukraine has reinforced political blockages in multilateral organizations, the UN and the OSCE in particular. And uh, this makes unified support for peacemaking endeavors uh, less likely, which is, which is a problem. Uh, at the same time, and we'll come back to this, I think in the event, um, multilateral organizations, they have proven uh, more resilient than um, uh, probably we feared at the outset of the, the war in Ukraine. Um, but that's a first trend, kind of reinforced blockages in multilateral organizations. A second one, uh, Villa mentioned it, is an intensification of geopolitical rivalries. Um, in particular, the rift between Russia and the West now, um, you could say, broadly permeates international affairs and uh, risks uh, fueling armed conflicts or undermining support for uh, resolution efforts. So that's a second um, trend. And then a third one um, relates to the fact that Russia is um, uh, waging a war of aggression in Ukraine, which shows that states are relying on military force to pursue their interests abroad. Uh, now, this trend predates clearly 24th uh, of February, uh, as we can see an increase in international conflicts in the past decade. This is also a dynamic that uh, Western countries have contributed to, uh, notably in the context of the war and terror. But in whatever form, states using violence in contravention of the UN Charter undermines the bedrock norms of peacemaking, namely nonviolence and specific settlement of disputes. And so it's, um, it's bad news. Uh, so these are sort of three trends reinforced by, by the war in Ukraine. I won't be much longer, but let me just say that there are also quite some trends that influence uh, peacemaking that remain 
unchanged. So it's not all about uh, Ukraine. And it's important to, uh, to keep this in mind, especially sitting in, in Europe and you know, talking at an event that looks at the, um, the impact of, of Ukraine. And you know, I, I think for peacemaking, one big problem is that the fragmentation of conflict um, the number of nature of armed groups now being such that sort of conventional peacemaking approaches don't work um, uh, anymore. Uh, we also have an uh, increasing number of uh, conflicts in countries that uh, experience a kind of toxic mix of poverty, climate change, weak governance and violence. Um, the Sahel can be mentioned here. And this leads to perpetuating cycles of violence and, and intractable conflicts, which are extremely difficult uh, to resolve. So a number of challenges that are not um, directly affected by the war in Ukraine, um, but that uh, throw all kinds of curveballs to, to peacemaking actors. Uh, I'll stop there and, and give the floor back to you, Yvick. Thank you very much, David, for those comprehensive um, comments. I think that indeed it's very important to remind ourselves that um, as both Ville and, uh, and David have said that um, this, are, this is uh, reinforcing already ongoing trends. This did not happen overnight. These are long-term trends that came to an absolute uh, peak and became very clear and undeniable, I suppose, uh, with, the, uh, with the invasion. Because as you said, some of these have already been observed, but we have still had a, a certain degree of faith in that, uh, uh, in those fundamental principles that we now see uh, very much uh, uh, under threat. Um, but let us go on to one more question for the panelists and then we're going to open up and I hope there'll be some uh, questions and engagement also from, from the audience who are all online. What we'd like to do is dig a little bit deeper into these uh, key implications and trends and not only looking at where we are now and on the challenges, but looking ahead, where do we think this will bring peacemaking going forward? Um, um, all now, but also once the, the, the war is over, because it will, of course, end at some point. Um, what we've seen so far in the intervention um, is a, a number of trends that also reflect what, what is outlined in the CMI INSAP paper. And, and those are the trends that we're moving from uh, interstate, from intra to interstate wars, uh, or proxy wars, rather, uh, as I said at the outset. Um, what we call in the paper weaponization station of international relations, where we uh, talked about as well how a, a lot of things that were previously not necessarily threats have become threats, uh, and the use of everything that we have in order to undermine uh, um, states in a war, but, and also balancing justice and political expediency, which I'm sure Villa will also talk about. So, Villa, where do you see these trends going, and what do you think we can expect? when the war in Ukraine ends in terms of international peace and security. Um, what do you think are the more long-term effects that we will see on multilateralism and the global world order? How about the Security Council, the engagement and role of the permanent, with five permanent members? And what about the regional actors, some of whom we heard are, are um, blocked, but um, again, maybe not as bad as we thought. Uh, so we'll uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think that we need uh, we see uh, several trends uh, uh, ongoing, but I would say that what's maybe uh, uh, specific for this moment that uh, there's the reality or uh, or at least the idea that uh, uh, this is a pivotal moment and what happens in Ukraine somehow will uh, define the structures of the peacemaking in the future mm -hmm. and. I would say that the challenge is that uh, when uh, uh, looking at the peace, in uh, it has been a long term uh, um, trend that um, as there's not solid multilateral structures, um, many conflict resolution processes are more or less seen as uh, discounting the future of peacemaking and future peacemaking structures. So you don't just focus on the conflict as such. But at the same time, you are focusing on uh, maintaining, changing, uh, uh, the uh, securing, destroying institutions. So whatever happens uh, in the peacemaking, it has always seen as a dual meaning, uh, one in the conflict as such, and one as the impact for the institution. And 
I would say that uh, currently looking at the Ukraine war, um, many people are, are discounting quite a lot of the uh, end result of that war towards the future uh, uh, events. And there's uh, maybe a too much pressure and idea that this will solve and define everything for the future. But I think that that's a trend which is now ongoing, ongoing that there's an assumption that um, that uh, Ukraine war somehow the end result, the process how it will uh, solve is a definition of a future peacemaking process. It might be so, but it may not be so. But I think that it may be a bit harmful for finding a practical solution to too much look at the, what this would mean for the whole world for the eternity. And uh, that's uh, maybe something that we have to have to go a bit a bit beyond. Uh, looking at the geopolitics, um, it's very easy. And 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 on this uh, uh, earlier point, one thing which I think that is already seen that uh, in the future there will be more and more regionalized uh, conflicts resolution process where region is uh, responsible. And also, I would say that uh, there might be. Um, even more need for the private peacemakers. But looking at then on the geopolitics, it's uh, very easy to say and see that uh, uh, war in Ukraine uh, leads to uh, consolidation of two blocks globally, uh, one around the US, another around uh, China. And the consolidation of not only uh, uh, security and military, uh, uh, capacities, but also all the capacities related to the hybrid warfare, including resources, technology, politics, media, and money. But I would say that there's a, quite a strong trend going against that. And uh, there's a lot of countries for different reasons uh, who don't see that the black and white block uh, uh, idea is useful for them. And uh, there are different reasons. Uh, many countries are dependent on, on, on security dependency on somewhere and the economic dependency uh, 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 on the elsewhere. And at the end of the day, their the system would collapse if they would be uh, forced to choose. Also, um, I think that in many countries, there is a question mark on the current way of um, uh, handling uh, Russia. While this, uh, as we can see from the UN votes, uh, I think Russia, uh, uh, Russia's uh, 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 attack in, in, uh, to Ukraine is certainly condemned. And uh, a big, big majority of the countries, countries see that. But there is a question mark on the how West have isolated Russia not for the cause, but how it had been done. And there's the fear, quite a strong one, that in the future, the threshold for using mechanism for isolation of, of countries will, will, uh, uh, will go down. And we would see more and more uh, those actions, which were earlier uh, uh, mostly targeted to the terrorist groups, now targeted to the states for a reason or another. And that's one element that many of the countries really see uh, uh, threatening for the uh, future. And it has nothing to do with uh, 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 how they perceive Russian behavior. And also, there's a lot of uh, uh, countries who have still uh, either principle, history, or practical uh, philosophy of, uh, of uh, being, um, being an unaligned. And, uh, for different reasons, I think that uh, we see this group as quite strong in the future as well. And it is interesting how this group of countries will impact on the peacemaking uh, uh, in the future, be because they are not the uh, small European countries anymore, but they are something very different. But traditionally, uh, uh, many times these type of uh, uh, entities have been useful bridges uh, in, in sovereign conflict. But I think that there, there, there might be a lot of um, um, a lot of movement. 
So this is the uh, trend that we should really um, uh, look at more in the uh, uh, in the future. What comes to the then uh, a bit more technical level, I think that really the manuals of mediation have to be revised. Um, uh, we were running a gender and inclusion inclusive mediation seminar together with the DPPA, and um, and uh, uh, looking at uh, how the manuals the the uh, uh, ideas have been built, the manuals have been built around solving internal conflicts, uh, having a government non-state actor with uh, 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 some uh, some legitimacy, and then finding grounds from power sharing and the uh, international package of, of supporting the peace process to move forward. But with the state the state wars, I think that it's not so simple. And maybe we have to find uh, manuals from the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and try to combine them <laughs> with the with the modern manuals. Uh, but really, uh, for this field, there's a lot to be uh, a lot to be studied uh, for um, preparing for this new situation. Thanks. Thank you uh, very much, Ville. Um, uh, yes, I'm not gonna. I was gonna ask a provocative question myself, but let's say that thank you very much. We, we hear that we need to revise the mediation guidelines and also some of those trends which you've described that you can also revisit in, in the paper and uh, the CMI insights. But moving on then um, uh, to David, um, if we then come back to also the trends that you outlined, if we then uh, go forward with or without uh, the war in Ukraine, um, how do you think um, that we will be and uh, will need to be working. And uh, you alluded to that you might see some opportunities where uh, there's some things that we might be able to do that we weren't in the past. So are there any new opportunities in this very gloomy reality that, that we are facing, um, both in terms of new, but also adapting what we have already? Over to you, David, thanks. Yes, thanks for this. So, um... Well, before looking to the, the future and talking about adaptation, um, let, let's briefly look at the, uh, the present and, and sort of engage this notion of um, uh, peacemaking opportunities. And I think it's a, it's a problematic notion when it comes to, um, you know, to, to talking about the war in, in Ukraine, because, um, you know, overall, as I have mentioned before, uh, the impact really is negative. We, we're dealing with a, a war of aggression on European soil, nuclear threats are back, um, you know, tensions between Russia and the West now run uh, very deep. So it's, uh, uh, it, it, it is a more difficult, much more difficult world for um, peacemaking we are dealing with. But having said this, there are a number of um, peacemaking related developments, which uh, fortunately, have uh, so far not panned out quite as negatively as feared, and we even had some positive surprises. And I think it makes sense to to look at some of these aspects um, a, a, a little bit before then uh, talking about the future. And I want to mention uh, four aspects in particular. Uh, one is the resilience of multilateral organizations. So uh, the OSCE, for example, um, we all know it's under pressure, uh, but it still functions. It still works in, in a number of uh, conflicts and, and helps to prevent, um, prevent violence there. Uh, if we come to the UN, uh, the Security Council has certainly seen many nasty debates in the past month, but outside of Ukraine, it has actually been able to take a number of uh, decisions. It's um, uh, mandated a new UN operation in uh, Afghanistan. It's given approval to a new African Union mission in Somalia. It has uh, imposed a new set of sanctions in response to the crisis in Haiti. These are just a few examples showing that um, the UN Security Council is not completely blocked. Um, Likewise, the UN Secretary General um, has been able to uh, make a contribution, um, notably for the Black Sea Grain Deal. So uh, we can say that multilateral peacemakers, while under pressure, they are faring better than what we feared in February. So that, that's one aspect. A second one is that um, 
in response to Russia's actions in Ukraine, we have seen quite a broad push to defend core international norms as they pertain to territorial integrity and the non-use of force. And these norms, as mentioned, they are the bedrock norms of, of peacemaking. Um, Ville already mentioned it in, in March, uh, 141 states condemned the Russian invasion in the UN General Assembly, only five countries voted against. In October, 143 states voted to condemn Russia's annexation of four regions in Ukraine, only five um, were against again. There are a few cracks um, in these votes, but overall they, they do show states' uh, commitment to the UN Charter principles. And I think that's a, that's a positive aspect to, to build on and to, um, to safeguard. And then a third um, aspect I wanted to mention has to do with escalation risk. So back in March, uh, we at Crisis Group, we put out a statement on Ukraine titled avoiding an even worse catastrophe in Ukraine. And in this statement, we talk about the risks of uh, nuclear escalation. We also talk about the risks of Russia expanding its attack on NATO countries. And um, so far, um, speaking uh, 1st of December, um, this kind of escalation has not materialized. And that's quite important for peacemaking because it shows that some of the safeguards and deterrence mechanisms against an all-out use of violence by states are, are still working. And um, that, that's quite significant. And then a fourth um, you know, sort of development that we may put in this um, sort of slightly positive category that relates to the various mediation initiatives that were launched in response to the war in Ukraine. They showed that even in the context of an escalating war, um, mediation can achieve things, notably lessening the effect uh, of the war on the civilian population in, in the conflict theater itself and beyond. And I think the Black Sea Grain Deal is particularly notable in this respect, um, also agreements to um, exchange prisoners, efforts to increase safety around nuclear sites. So these, these kinds of um, talks um, on the periphery, you could say, um, they, are, they are quite notable. Now, if that's the, uh, the present, then you know, let's, let's briefly um, look into the future. And, and here I'll mention, again, uh, four areas where, where I do think um, some refocusing, some adaptation, and some innovation um, is, uh, is called for. And one, uh, and I'll be brief there because Villa mentioned it, it's um, mediation in the context of uh, wars between states. And these wars often include territorial um, disputes, which are, which are tricky to resolve. Um, so I think there is, a, there is a need to think about the contributions of peacemaking in these kinds of conflicts, perhaps also the limitations um, uh, of it. And uh, this is relevant uh, also in the context of intensified uh, geopolitical rifts, as we have talked about. Um, then a second um, area, uh, Ukraine, I think, reminds us that uh, conflicts and responses to them, they have quite far-reaching socioeconomic repercussions. And we see in Ukraine that peacemaking actors, they can uh, play a role in terms of um, bringing about solutions that help to mitigate some of these uh, consequences. And this work can happen even if a conflict overall is not ripe for, um, for a settlement. And so uh, these kinds of efforts um, uh, may, may be worth to refocus on uh, a bit. Then what we also see with Ukraine, but equally with many other conflicts, is that once armed violence starts, it's extremely difficult to bring it to an end. That's what we see in the past 10 years. There are many more wars that have started and, and ended. And so this really should point to the need to double down our efforts on prevention and think about the contribution of mediation uh, peacemaking actors in, um, in this context. Um, uh, peacemaking is often seen as a response to uh, already ongoing, already escalated wars. Um, but how can we uh, prevent violence before it occurs, I think is, a, is an area of focus. And then a fourth um, area has to do 
with the development we are seeing in, in Western countries, which is a push to increase military spending and a return of, you could say, sort of um, conventional deterrence thinking. And there is um, you know, good reason for, for this. But at the same time, I think we should not lose sight of the lessons that um, you know, conflicts uh, like Afghanistan, Libya, Mali teach us, which is that conflicts cannot be resolved with military means only and uh, kind of heavy handed military interventions. They often exacerbate um, insecurity and, and instability. And so we need to think about sort of smart or small footprint, uh, civilian dialogue focused um, uh, approaches and uh, peacemaking actors in the context of the debate we, we have in, in Europe and in North America need to make this argument a bit more forcefully, teaming up, uh, using public and private channels, defending the notion of uh, compromise uh, and, and dialogue a, a bit more forcefully than we have done um, before. So that would be a fourth area of, of focus when it comes to uh, future work. Um, I'll leave it at that and, and hand the floor back to you, Becca. Thank you very much, uh, David. Um, uh, some very uh, good uh, ideas there and directions in, in which to go. Um, some of which, uh, of course, uh, are things we've been arguing for for a while, such as prevention um, uh, being a much better option than than, um, uh, than war, clearly. Um, but this gives us a, even more of a momentum, hopefully, to come back to those as well. Um, there are a couple of questions in the chat, and then I also have um, something if there's more time, but let me first go to the to the participants to see what they um, are interested in. There's been a question about what this means for US and Russia relations, um, meaning this um, are also US-Russia relations likely to be impacted by this and, and, and even a breakdown, and they're referring to um, start renewal talks. Um, there's also um, a question about um, the overall impact that this war will have on the effectiveness of peace mediation as a tool of conflict resolution. I think some of those uh, some of those aspects have already been addressed, uh, but I still uh, thought that it would be useful to read it out. And then from from Guy Vanim, who we know well, um, there is a longer question um, which is referring to a, a slogan within the peace mediation community. Uh, where we say all conflict can be resolved, which is of course something that uh, CMI as well uh, is one of our fundamental principles that we believe that all wars can be resolved and that peacemaking is the art of compromise. Um, um, so we're referring more to Villa's point here that there's a reinforced use of language of good and evil and David that you mentioned that states are pursuing their goals through the use of force against which dialogue and diplomacy also seem impotent. Uh, do we then need to abandon such slogans and instead embrace the notion that peacemakers need to make sure the right side wins? Or is it more a question of understanding how to combine the use of force and the use of diplomacy? So very tricky question there from, from Guy. Um, I will um, hand over to, to Villa to comment on those questions and then we'll see if there's uh, another round before I ask for some um, closing remarks from both of you. So Villa, please. And thank you so much. Maybe comment first on the uh, effectiveness of, of mediation. And I think that there's one trend more, which is not related to Ukraine, but is uh, maybe Ukraine is a consequence of, of, of this trend that, uh, and there might be people who can uh, say this better, but uh, someone who was uh, uh, observing the US elections uh, made a very good point that there's uh, less and less um, uh, 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 election debates where you have all the politicians of the same group. And I think that this is a global trend uh, that uh, uh, politics is more and more driven uh, by the uh, uh, unilateral statements than directly uh, through social media and the uh, popular su support is uh, uh, is uh, uh, got through the uh, not through the debates with other 
but uh, through different means by exam ex uh, expanding their their own bubble. And uh, I would say that this trend is also happening at the very broad level. That if I, as a peacemaker, would say that uh, is there less or more negotiations and dialogue, I would say less. I think that there's some more and more things that uh, parties are figuring by themselves, uh, doing analysis, uh, thinking, uh, using um, uh, back channels, and less and less actual uh, negotiations, and less and less uh, uh, during and maybe even after the COVID people, the people contacts. And I think that that's uh, maybe a one challenge with which I think we are facing in the field of mediation, that uh, from the party size, there's uh, much more willingness to make unilateral moves than maybe we have seen earlier. And that's really challenged the way of uh, uh, how we have used uh, to work. Uh, of course, there's others, other trends as well, but I, on the effectiveness, that's what I, uh, what I think that they, they, they exist. On the start negotiations, my understanding is still that um, for Russia, um, uh, discussion of strategic balance is a very important. And if uh, someone knows better, the US haven't abandoned those ideas either. I don't know if there's official negotiations or not, but my understanding is that uh, uh, while there's a war in Ukraine, uh, the uh, uh, discussion on the on those topics is uh, uh, at least not abandoned for the for the uh, whole future. But someone else will know know much uh, much better. On the uh, on the geese question, thank you for very much. I will forward to David. <laughs> 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 Thank you. I'll hand straight over to David. <laughs> Thank you for this, Vile. Um, yes. So, so perhaps this um, a question from Guy. You know, all conflicts can be resolved to abandon the notion. I don't think we need to abandon the notion because um, e e even before the war in Ukraine. Um, saying all conflicts can be resolved didn't mean that all conflicts can be resolved, you know, at, at any time. Um, it, it is quite clear that a, a resolution of conflicts re requires certain conditions to be in place, um, notably the genuine willingness of the conflict parties to settle a conflict. And um, uh, or, or that's not, not um, not the case in uh, in Ukraine at the moment, um, uh, quite clearly. Um, but this doesn't mean that we need to uh, uh, abandon the ambition to um, uh, resolve conflicts. Um, uh, I think that remains that remains valid. But um, what also remains valid is this caveat that conditions they need to be uh, conducive. Uh, for resolution. There are moments where conflicts cannot be resolved. Um, and we have such a moment uh, in, in Ukraine uh, currently. So that's one answer. And then um, a second reflection on this question of uh, mediation effectiveness. Um, I'm uh, repeating a point I made in my earlier presentation, which is that uh, peacemaking is affected by the trends that uh, both predate the war in Ukraine and some trends that are not primarily influenced by the war in Ukraine. And uh, one is that we have an increasing number of armed actors uh, and also conflation of, of motivations, um, sort of criminal, economic, uh, political motivations that make it very difficult to resolve conflicts um, uh, through sort of conventional peacemaking approaches. And indeed, we have seen a decreasing number of comprehensive peace agreements in, in recent years. And so I think the effectiveness of peace mediation, at least the conventional uh, approach uh, to it, um, has, has been reduced in, uh, even before the war in Ukraine uh, started. Um, what is tricky about um, this sort of interstate war phenomenon that seems to increase is that it involves territorial disputes. And territorial disputes, I think it was 
researchers in uh, Uppsala University um, who showed that territorial disputes um, uh, are, are more difficult to uh, resolve um, uh, compared to disputes over the nature of the state, for example. And it makes sense why, because um, you, you, it's, it's much more difficult to escape a zero sum uh, game. There is less room for compromise when you fight over territory, either it's party A's or party B's. And um, so that does pose a number of, uh, of difficulties, but difficulties, again, that, um, you know, have, have existed before uh, 24 uh, February and that peacemaking actors have had to grapple with. Thank you, David. Um, we have a couple of more questions um, that I think we can quickly address, very tricky ones. Two um, related to um, uh, nuclear threats, uh, but also um, how to deal with those and other of the large challenges. And the other one is more related to uh, criminal justice in Ukraine. So first, um, there's a question from Christine Seifer at Berghof um, asking about the EU commissioner, uh, von der Leyen, announced yesterday that the EU will cooperate with Ukraine on the creation of a special tribunal, tribunal, which is going to be backed by the UN, to hold the Russian leadership to account for the crime of aggression. Which effect would such a tribunal have on the future of peacemaking, in, in your uh, views? And uh, in a similar note, John Packer is asking, how does all the talk and resources of trials help in the circumstances? Implications, evidence, and I would ask that. Do you think it helps the, the resolving uh, of, uh, of the ongoing war? I assume we're not going to talk about it resolving it, rather exhausting it. Uh, but the other question then um, is a little more uh, complicated. Well, first, simply ones from a colleague of ours, Mahmoud Kain, is asking about the nuclear threat. Um, it was at the outset taken quite seriously. Um, do you think that this is no longer the case, is the question, or is that still a prominent threat? Um, and John Packer also has commented a little bit on uh, a related uh, question, but not the same, how uh, the nuclear risk uh, has already been acute in the past. Um, um, and then um, we developed certain instruments to, to address that, but, but which have been ignored. Uh, and now again, the main instruments to address some of these big challenges, including wars between states, has once again been undermined by uh, who are supposed to be their fundamental upholders. So, has trust really diminished um, or have um, has this always been the case that the, there's been an undermining of these instruments by the big actors? Um, is it really different now um, that this is happening? Is it not just the same again of interest-based application of these institutions and structures? Um, I will leave this to you um, and then I have a, one of my own that I'd like you to comment on quickly before, so that would also be your closing remarks since we're coming to an end. And that's where does that, that leave us as actors, uh, as either um, civil society and, and private diplomacy actors, what, where does that leave us in all of this? What's our particular role? Um, what does the reshaping of, of peacemaking mean, mean for us? Um, I will go to Villa first again, uh, and then David, and then we're going to close. So, Villa, please. Thank you so much. Um, starting uh, still a bit on the on the nuclear and, and nuclear threat, I think that this is the same package as uh, as many of the others that there start to be a shift, because I think the past twenty years, um, more or less, I think that uh, the biggest worry for um, uh, states have been that uh, 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 powerful weapons will end up in the hands of non-state actors. And that has been a glue that has been the atmosphere of, of discussions among the states, whether it's nuclear something else or, or something else. And now we are again in the phase where we are questioning of if the uh, states which have a, a, a legitimacy and, 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 and right to, to have those type of arms, is that really uh, uh, something that they would be used? So I think that the, in the same way as many other things, the uh, conflict and the definition of conflict and the questions have changed from uh, 
conflict between the states and non-state actors to between the states. Uh, and I think that's the shift uh, which which is there. And again, it's it's something that uh, we have just to learn uh, how to do again. So that's the comment on the um, on the uh, uh, nuclear nuclear issue. The the other comment I have on on the trials and uh, and, and and more broadly on the on the different uh, uh, justice elements of, of war. Um, it's always a tricky question, but one challenge is that um, because of the current media environment and access to the information and at the end of the day commitment of the European states and citizens uh, to support Ukraine, we start to be more and more involved. And uh, I think that it's important that we don't do ourselves too much of a trap uh, to, to go to the point, not in Ukraine, but in European capitals and European citizens, that we figure out so many things uh, against, against Russia that it's impossible anymore to start to move to another direction uh, if uh, the conditions are right and, and if uh, uh, Moscow will show some kind of um, uh, flexibility on, on 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 having a decent solution, and I think that that's the thread that if we wire up too many uh, uh, as such, just good things uh, to support the Ukraine. The moment uh, when the peace can be done, hopefully there's not too much homemade traps for us that we cannot move forward, move back on the on the, on the right track. And where this leaves us, as a peacemaker, I think that, uh, or professional peacemaking, and not the peacemaker, I, I think that we have to be very humble and, and understand that now it's time to re really learn, uh, uh, not to take the old guidance from the uh, uh, from our our uh, guidebook and say that we know everything, but now it's really time to be a humble and, and try to learn as much as possible uh, because the field is really changing and uh, and if we want to solve the conflict in the future as well we have to renew ourselves thanks thank you very much Vilma. david please yes um excellent questions and um uh, you know, all, all quite vast um, themes. So I'll, I'll be very brief, also seeing the advancing time uh, on uh, criminal justice. Um, it, it, in a way, we, we see a sort of comeback of, of the debate that we had in the early 2000s, notably around the International Criminal Court, the peace versus justice debate, um, where I think the incompatibility uh, between uh, peacemaking and justice is has has been rather uh, exaggerated but you know at the same time peacemaking is uh, um, is sometimes confronted with uh, with dilemmas uh, exactly how this will play out in ukraine i think it's too too early to tell and um, it's difficult to to speculate on this i can draw your attention to a recently uh, published book by Pierre Azan, um, for those of you speaking French, called uh, Négocier avec le diable. Um, there's also a YouTube uh, video uh, widely viewed where he engages um, in a very informed way some of these uh, notions, and uh, he does apply it also to the current context of Ukraine. So that's a good resource. And then um, a second comment on um, nuclear threats. Um, so here, uh, I think what's worrying is that um, to, to a degree, the nuclear taboo has been broken um, it, 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 by uh, sort of open threats being made to the use of nuclear weapons. And, and that, is a, that is worrying, that is a problem um, and, and you know, need, needs to be countered and to some degree has. Um, 
I can refer to the work of my crisis group uh, colleague Olga Oliker, who has written about the um, nuclear dimension of, uh, of, of the war in Ukraine in, in very informed ways. Uh, perhaps um, I can post a, a link to some of her articles on this topic, which are well worth um, considering. And then uh, lastly, your question, Yibeke, a role of private diplomacy actors. I think your role is to, to be at the cutting edge, to, um, you know, to push, to drive uh, innovation forward, to explore some of these new, new themes um, that we have uh, talked about. Uh, I think in interstate wars, wars that are uh, geopolitically charged, um, uh, probably the official mediators will, will mostly be state actors or perhaps multilateral uh, organizations, and, and we see this with the role that Turkey and, and UN and the UN are playing. Uh, but there is an ample space for private diplomacy actors to inject ideas, to uh, open up contacts, to do you know the various things that you that you do, and I uh, think it's really necessary, even if uh, perhaps the level of controversy. Uh, of, um, of of private diplomacy and mediation is a bit higher than it was before. It's a bit more difficult for these things to go completely on the radar. But it's really important that you uh, you continue to work, uh, as I said, to at the cutting edge um, and and driving some of these innovations. Uh, I'll end there and uh, thank everybody for their uh, participation. It's us who should say thank you, David. Thank you very, very much for being with us this afternoon and for these very insightful comments and suggestions. Also to Villa, of course, and to all the audience that were there. Um, I know we're one minute over and I take pride in finishing on time, but I'll just add a couple of uh, summarizing points that, uh, again, reiterating that we've um, agreed that the overall impact of the Russian invasion of Ukraine is very negative, both on uh, the multilateral system and on peacemaking, and that it's uh, really uh, putting to the fore some questions of our fundamental organizing and safeguarding principles. Um, but I think it's important to remember then, as, as Vila said, that um, Ukraine is a consequence of uh, several ongoing trends and not reverse. It's not that uh, Ukraine is caused, or not Ukraine, the invasion of Russia in Ukraine is causing uh, all of these uh, negative impacts, but it's a combination the other way around. Um, but also to uh, highlight what you said, David, that the multilateral system had stood better against these challenges that we initially thought. So let us take some time going forward to understanding all of those other parts, as we also said, the other parts of the UN system, for example, that are working, that keep uh, working in a positive way and uh, let's reinforce those uh, at the same time. We have some opportunities in the next year coming along with the new UN Agenda for Peace. There's also the anniversary of the World Bank Pathway for Peace to, to uh, underline our uh, commitment to prevention and to really look at where we can um, continue to um, play a positive role. And finally, of course, that we all need to be, uh, we need to adapt. And this means that we have to be, as Villa said, humble in order to learn, uh, to then uh, subsequently drive innovation forward. And like you said, David, and open up uh, contacts uh, and inject new ideas. I thought that's very uh, much what we try and do already. Um, and how we can support and complement state actors in this new evolving uh, reality. With that, um, let me say thank you once again, also to the CMI comms team who's put all of this together, uh, to those who've contributed and worked on the paper that I hope you will all read now. And I look forward to continuing this discussion and work with uh, all of you uh, as we go forward. Thank you very, very much, and I wish you a lovely evening. Thank you.